So when somebody's worth hundreds of millions of dollars and tells me that I'm selling financial crack in middle America, it doesn't feel good at all. So what I did from that moment on was really try to figure out a way to prove him wrong. Because if I could prove him wrong, then not only do I earn his business, but I also proved to myself that what I've been doing all these years was the right thing. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you smash that like button and click subscribe. For those of you listening on a podcast platform, be sure to subscribe on whatever platform that is and leave us a rating if you can. The more likes, ratings, and subscriptions that we get, the more we can spread the message and grow our community. So we also have a free Facebook group. It's called The Average Joe Finances Network. Check us out, join the group, join the community, ask questions, and become a part of the team. All of our other social media accounts are listed in our flow page, and we have them in the video or podcast description below. Hey, how's it going, everybody? So today's guest is Michael Lush, and I'm really excited to talk to him. Uh, I've actually seen him on on the news before with some of the things that he's doing. Uh, So Michael, for three nights a week, was teaching his friends, neighbors, past clients in live classes on how to replace their mortgage with a HELOC and start saving tens of thousands of dollars in interest. Now, it didn't all just start for him like that there. There was there was a lot of work to get there. He used to be a mortgage, a mortgage loan officer, and he always did what he believed was best for his clients. So he ran into a wealthy mentor that showed him what was wrong with what he had been doing the last 15 years as a mortgage officer. So instead of landing his wealthy clients, uh, their mortgage business, he discovered that the wealthy financed their homes using lines of credit. Uh, so ma- he had many late nights to to research this program and how he's doing it. Um, he's got this this bank secret that he's going to share with uh, us today that we can learn a little bit. So for those of you that are listening, be prepared for some pretty awesome stuff. Uh, Michael, I'm really excited to have you on the show with me today. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. All right, right on. So I, I just gave a small tidbit, like wave top background of who you are and what you do. So if you could, could you share a little bit more with us? Tell us your story. Yeah. So this started, um, if I go way back, really right out of college. Uh, My first gig was in the mortgage industry. And a buddy of mine who was a year ahead of me had already started a year before I did. And once I graduated, he's like, you know what? You know, you've got to check this out. I said, what are you doing? He's like, I work for this company. And I thought they did investments because their name was very similar to an investment firm. And I was like, yeah, I've always had an interest in that. That's what my mom's done for 42 years. And he's like, no, that's not what we do. We, we do mortgages. I was like, okay, I don't know anything about that. He's like, come on, man. He's like, just come in for an interview. And uh, I kind of brushed it off for a little bit. And uh, he finally came to my apartment at the time and said, hey, take a look at what some of the top guys are doing in the office. 20, 30, 40, $50,000 a month. And I'm like, all right, sign me up. I don't even know what a mortgage is. I've never had one. I don't own a home, um, but I'll figure this out. So I go in, have an interview. And it was funny because I, I, I'm kind of the guy that will back myself into a corner where I will say something so outlandish that if I don't achieve it, the embarrassment, the fear of embarrassment is more of a motivating factor than the excitement of success. So I told the guy, the senior vice president who was interviewing me, I said, if you hire me, I will be the best hire this year in the entire company. And that was in January. So I got started in January and it was in October. We were a large mortgage firm, uh, publicly traded, ninth largest in the world or in the country at the time. And so all of our trainings, he would corral everyone to this huge auditorium for training. And he would randomly call on people and throw an objection at them and see how well they overcome it and kind of use that as a training tool. So he called on me. Threw out an objection. I went through how we typically overcome the objection. And he stopped right there and he said, anybody see any flaws in that? And maybe some people, I don't remember perfectly what happened, but he said, that is exactly why 
Michael is now becoming newcomer of the year for the entire company. I was like, wow, I didn't even know. And when he told me, it was in September. <laughs> it wasn't December. So my numbers were so far ahead of everyone else that there was no way that they were going to catch up by the end of the year. So they had already given me the title of newcomer of the year. And oh, wow. I was as shocked as anyone else. It was, I mean, again, and trust me, from January to September, there were some ups and downs, some roller coasters, but I definitely had some big, big months. And um, so I became newcomer of the year and did well with that company, rose through the ranks, you know, assistant manager, manager, then senior manager, and uh, running some branches, and then 2008 hits. And my wife was also working for the company. So not only was I one of the top senior managers, I was number three in the company out of 1,500. She was uh, number five loan officer in the company out of thousands. So collectively, we had really good income for folks that were in our early 20s. Now, what do you think we were doing with that money? We weren't investing. Not, not investing. We weren't yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Uh, I was the last person you should give big checks to. So uh, not, not quite paycheck to paycheck, but pretty doggone close. You know, that collectively, we're making well over a half a million dollars a year. And I'm buying cars, Escalades, Denali's, four-wheelers because I'm a redneck, um, motorcycles because I'm a redneck, uh, you know, big house and things of that, nice vacations, going to Hawaii. So as fast as it was coming in, we were spending it. And in 2008, it was like they pulled the brake on real estate, right? So that locomotive that we were driving just suddenly stopped and hit us in the rear end. Had lots of debt. Long story short, went broke. Uh, but that same company called me probably nine months later, and I took that as an opportunity to move back to Nashville, my hometown. And that same company called and said, look, we're resurrecting again. Uh, we're not going to do subprime stuff like we used to do. We're getting solely into government loans, which really the only thing at the time that was available, FHA, VA, USDA, Fannie and Freddie. And we want you to head up Nashville operations. We want to make you director of operations. It's like, I've got nothing else to do. Absolutely. You know, get me back to my former glory. Yeah, so sure, I did. And where they, yeah. And where they got their money was actually from a hedge fund. And so the hedge fund manager, his mom and dad actually lived in Nashville. He was out of Connecticut at the time worth upper hundreds of millions of dollars now billionaire. And so he would fly into town to, to meet with his mom and dad. But when, you know, passing through, he would stop at my office and mentor me. And it was after a couple of visits, I took the opportunity to say, you know what? I need to get in this guy's sphere of influence. He, he's where I want to be, at least financially. You know, I didn't know all the other things that were important in life at the time, you know, family, faith and all that. So I said, now I got to get my finances in order. And this guy's got plenty of money. So let me figure out what he's doing. So I took the opportunity and said, look, let's do this. You're a hedge fund manager. You by default technically own this company because we got to pay all this money back. You know, millions of dollars we got to pay back to this hedge fund plus a rate of return. So why don't you introduce me to your sphere of influence? What I do, I do really well. So how about I do mortgages for them? And if they're mortgages, I'm sure they're big. And big mortgages are big paychecks, big paychecks, big commissions, big profits. You get your money back faster. This is a fail-proof plan, right? And that's when he kind of hit me with it. And he only spent 10 minutes explaining it to me. But he said, look, we don't do mortgages. And I was like, okay, that's what I thought. You guys pay cash for everything. He said, no, we always use other people's money. He said, but what we typically will use is a home equity line of credit. And everything I had been taught in the mortgage industry was a home equity line of credit is a credit card on your home. That's not something you want. So when we're on the phone with customers and we're doing a cash out refinance or just some other type of refinance, we're like, okay, we got to roll in that home equity line of credit. We've got to roll in the credit card. Those are bad for you. And he's like, no, no, they're not. He's like, it just depends on what the audience is. He said, in my audience, there's, we're not going to do mortgages. In mortgages, I don't know if you knew this, uh, mortgage is an old French term. And it's it, basically the definition of mortgage is death pledge. That's what it is in old French. It's, it's a death contract. So more being mortality, gauge being a certificate or contract with the death pledge. And he said, Michael, to be honest with you, what you're doing is you're selling financial crack to middle America. And that hurt, that hurt bad because I've always had been a moral guy and I've always thought that I was doing the best by my client. So when somebody's worth hundreds of millions of dollars and tells me that I'm selling financial crack to middle America, it doesn't feel good at all. So what I did from that moment on was really try to figure out a way to prove him wrong. Because if I could prove him wrong, then not only do I earn his business, but I also proved to myself that what I've been doing all these years was the right thing. 
And it took about a year. I uh, hired a CPA, an actuary, and a couple of buddies of mine that you know, actually one of them works with me today. He's my right-hand man. He's a genius. And uh, we tried to poke holes in it. And we couldn't. And more than we tried to prove him wrong, we actually proved him right. And so in 2012 is when I took the leap of faith and told my wife, we're no longer going to consume mortgages. She said, okay, well, how are we going to get it paid off? I said, we're going to refinance the whole thing into a home equity line of credit. First lien position, home equity line of credit. Not second lien. Big difference. We can get into that here in a little bit. But long story short, uh, from 2012 to 2016, early 2016, we paid our house off. We didn't change anything about our budget. Now, obviously, I was in the mortgage industry. So was I making the money that I was making back in the glory days? No, not by a long shot. I was making good money. I was providing a living. I had two kids at the time and a wife. So I wasn't going to go back to the type of situation that we were in uh, prior to 2008, where we're living paycheck to paycheck. So, you know, we were making a good living, but we, it was, we weren't killing it. So on, you know, what I would now consider a modest income, we were able to pay our home off in three and a half years. And from that moment on, I linked up with a, a buddy of mine, Jimmy, who was a marketing mentor who said, listen, you, you've got to turn this into a business. There's a lot of people out there that want to know what you know, and they will pay for it. So that's when I created a business, which uh, now called Lush Enterprises, and a form of it is Replace Your Mortgage. And we've got other entities that are attached to it now, but Replace Your Mortgage is the one that's most well known. And now I've been teaching thousands. Uh, so we have about 6,000 clients now. We've probably helped 10,000 people pay their home off in an accelerated fashion. Or some folks find out that they can pay their home off in an accelerated fashion and choose to actually leverage it to grow wealth. Kind of like you got the two philosophies, right? Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or Dave Ramsey. We lean more towards Robert Kiyosaki. Now, I say that because the the first thing you have to be is you, you have to understand your budget. You have to be on a budget. You have to be cash flow positive. So this isn't for everybody. And I don't want to exclude it to just those who make good income because that's not really who it's for. It's not just for those that have a really good income or educated or highly disciplined or mastered their budget. It's also for those that are in the middle class and sometimes even lower middle class as long as they're cash flow positive and they've mastered their budget. So it, the, the rest is, you know, within 60 days of me abandoning the mortgage industry, you know, God really had my back and the income from this opportunity skyrocketed. And it was more than I was making in my heyday. So I was like, okay, God, thank you. Now I don't have to worry about finances. All I need to focus on is one, glorifying you, but also loving on these people and showing them how to best utilize a home equity line of credit, more efficiently utilize debt. And, in, you know, in a little bit, I want to get back into history of where a mortgage came to be and how a HELOC came to be. Because in America, financing real estate and mortgages is extremely archaic compared to a lot of other countries. You know, Australia, over 80% of Australian citizens use what they call a money merge account. And a money merge account is merging your real estate loan into your bank loan. And what it is, is it's their term for a home equity line of credit. So in Australia, they've been doing this for decades. Most of the country, most of the citizens, this is what they do. And ironically, the average Australian will pay off two homes in 14 years. What do you think the average American pays off their only home? What's the average? 26 years. Over 30. Ooh. Even if they take a third, now, why is that? Because every five to seven years, we're refinancing or selling for another house, but we're refinancing to a lower rate on a longer term back to a 30-year term. And we think that that's saving us money. And it may on a monthly basis, but it doesn't long term. And that's what we got to get back to is we got to get back to thinking long term and not just short term of what we can cram as Americans into our budget. So Australians don't think that way. South Africans don't think that way. Folks in the United Kingdom, they don't think that way. You know, if you look at a house that's, $400,000 and you finance it on a 30-year term, how much is that house going to cost you? Probably $800,000, right? Yeah, so much what Austria, yeah. So what you're, you're buying one house for you and one for the bank. So what Australians, United Kingdom, you know, South Africans think is they look at that house and say, okay, at what point is that house, if I finance it that way, am I able to sell it and actually make money? The Americans think we buy it for four hundred dollars five years later, if we sell it for four fifty, dollars we made money. We didn't because you didn't take into account all the interest that you paid for the five years. And keep in mind, the first five years of 30-year mortgage are basically interest-only payments. It's front-loaded with interest. So when you go to pay it off, you look at the balance of what you owe, and you're like, doggone it, it's the same as what I owed five years ago. 
it's designed to be that way because they know that we refinance or sell every five to seven years. So the bank's rushing in to get their profits first before you refinance. Um, that That is in a nutshell that. Now, I would love to get into the history of mortgages. Yeah, sure. I mean, so it's 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 fascinating though because you know it, when you think about it, when you look at your amortization right table and you're trying to figure out, you know, looking at these 360 payments that you have to make over the next 30 years, mm-hmm. and, and it's not until you hit that 15 year mark where you really start to see that you're paying more principal than you are paying interest, and exactly. that's a scary thing. It is. It is. It's archaic. It's very archaic. So as far as the history of mortgages, it didn't. It wasn't always that way here in this country. Um, actually, prior to 1913, a mortgage was designed very similar to a home equity line of credit. So what I'm actually teaching folks isn't something that's new. It's actually extremely old. It's older than the modern day mortgage here in this country. So a mortgage used to be something that was open and money could move in and out freely. It was especially popular with farmers. Because if you owned a farm, say it's worth 200,000 and you're like, you know what? I need to go buy some equipment. So you run down to the bank that day and say, I need to borrow $10,000 because I got to buy equipment. Obviously these are inflated numbers based on 1913 or 1912, but I need $10,000 to buy equipment. No problem. Let's change the deed. Here's your 10 grand. Thank you. And then you go sell your crop and then you pay back the 10 grand plus some. So money can move in and out of your, your mortgage very freely. What, What is it today? It's a closed in product, meaning, the only way to get cash out of your home is to refinance, which is very expensive, and closing costs and things of nature, and time consuming, 30 to 45 days on average, or sell. Neither one of those are ideal. So we talk, we look at that generation uh, prior to 1913, our great grandfathers and grandmothers, and, and we always hear the same stories. They bought a house and paid it off in five to 10 years. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, they were a better generation. They didn't have social media and TV and things like that to distract them. They were more educated and more disciplined, but they also had better tools because a mortgage back then was entirely different than a mortgage is today. So why do I keep talking about 1913? What do you think happened in 1913? It kind of changed that game forever for Americans. The government got involved. (laughs) It's usually what happened. Almost. (laughs) Not quite. It's the Federal Reserve. And it's, it's a really cool name. People think that because it's Federal Reserve, it's part of the government. It's not. It's neither federal nor is it a reserve. But what the Federal Reserve is, is a central bank that is the backstop of community banks and national banks. And what it does is it allows banks to execute a really cool magic trick. It's called fractional reserve lending. Now, what that means is for every dollar you put in a bank account, they have $10 that they can lend out, sometimes 15. So if you put 10 grand in, they got 100 grand. Put 100 grand in, they got a million. So after the, you know that happened in 1913, which, by the way, do you know the history of the Federal Reserve and the creature of Jekyll Island? That's a great book, by the way. Have you heard, heard of that book? No. Uh, what's what's the name of the book? The Creature of Jekyll Island. The Creature of Jekyll Island? Yes. Yeah, really good book. Check it out. It, it's basically a, a biography. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it's, it's a true account of how the Federal Reserve came to be. It was actually created by J.P. Morgan. So J.P. Morgan and four or five other, other individuals had a private meeting off the coast of Georgia on an island called Jekyll Island that he owned. And so private that the servants there didn't know who was coming. Um, so, And they were also so powerful that those six individuals in that meeting comprised of one quarter of the world's GDP. That's how wealthy they were. So in that meeting, they came up with a business plan of the Federal Reserve. So after 1913, the banks get together and say, look, if we get more deposits, because every time somebody deposits a dollar, we have 10. If every time somebody deposits $10, we have 100. We need more deposits. How are we going to go about doing that? So they looked at how Americans were what was called an operating account. How were they executing their operating account? They were operating in and out of their mortgage. It was almost their checking account. They didn't leave it under the mattress. They didn't go put it in a checking and savings account for the most part. They were operating in and out of their mortgage, which is why they were able to pay it off so quickly. So the banks got together and changed the mortgage forever, and they made it a closed-in product, meaning money could only go in freely, but not come out freely. So think about that as an individual. If you have an account that's closed in, you know, just like today, you, you may have a mortgage. How scary would it be to put 100% of your income into your mortgage? Month one, you're already freaking out at the end of the month. Why? Because when it's time to pay your bills, your groceries or vacation, it's stuck in the bank's treasure chest. You can't get it back out. So what are you going to do as a consumer? 
you're going to say, okay, well, now I'm going to put some of my money towards my mortgage and I'm going to leave the rest of it behind so that I can pay those other bills. Where are we leaving it? We're not leaving it under the mattress. Where do we put it? We put it in a checking and savings account where they pay us on national average 0.25% per year. It's a horrible rate of return. Actually, it's not even keeping up with inflation, especially this year. Not, not even close. So your money's, yeah. So now your money's actually going backwards, right? So a checking account, a savings account is a liability. But what does that do for the mortgage? So the mortgage, if you only put some of your money towards the mortgage instead of all of it, well, you're going to pay on it longer, right? So if you pay on it longer, time and balance are far more important than interest rate. So if time and balance are, are higher over a longer period of time, you're going to pay more interest. But that wasn't the number one goal. Number one goal was to segregate your income. They wanted to separate you from your cash. So since it became a closed-end product and you had to leave money behind, you left it in their coffers, in the checking and savings account, and that's where they grow core deposit. Why do I know this? Because I sit on the board of a bank. I've sat on the boards of other banks. I can tell you in those meetings, the number one focus is how do we grow core deposits? That's what they want. They want more depositors so that they can lend more money out. It's called velocity banking. So that's a, a history lesson on mortgages. And a HELOC is really just going back to basics. It's not teaching us something new. It's going back to the way that we used to finance real estate more efficiently to become financially independent because a HELOC is an instrument that is open-ended. Money can move in and out freely. A lot of these HELOCs, you get a debit card with it, you get checks with it, you get online bill pay. You know, I, right now I could just swipe my HELOC card and pull as much cash out of it as I want to tonight. I don't have to wait until tomorrow. I can do it tonight just like I could if it was a checking and savings account. But I don't do that because what is it doing? It's going to work for me. So when we get off this podcast and I go to bed, my money is working for me as opposed to in a checking account where it's working against me. Right on. Yeah. So I, I've, I've seen, you know, some of your videos uh, before. So I kind of, I kind of have like the gist of it, right? Where, mm -hmm. you know, you're pretty much essentially you're, you're taking a HELOC out for the entire um, value of your home, the entire price of your home for the mortgage, right? You're paying off your mortgage Almost. with your HELOC yeah. or, mm -hmm. well, you work it to that point, right? You take the HELOC and you yeah. just dump the entire thing into it. Um, and then you take your paycheck, right? And you're, taking pretty much all of your pay and just dumping it back into the HELOC. And for any other right. bills or expenses, you're using your HELOC to pay those, right? So mm -hmm. you're having yeah, like a, a, a much larger upfront payment, monthly payment into that HELOC versus, you know, what you're, versus like, you know, just making the mortgage payment and then, you know, budgeting your money to the side for the other things, uh, your other bills that you have to pay. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I, I totally get that. But now how would somebody who like, you know, they've already got their budget set up, like, you know, mm -hmm. they're paying their mortgage, they're paying their car payment, um, they're investing, you know, 10 to 15% or more, right? Whatever it is that they're mm -hmm. investing um, in separate uh, brokerage accounts, or they're investing, you know, this much into real estate every month, or, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm putting this much to the side for my next down payment on my next property. Um, yep. How would that work for somebody in a situation like that? Would they would just would they still put their stuff to the side and then put everything else nope. into the HELOC? Like how, how does this work? No. Let's take a brief moment to hear from our show sponsors. What's going on, everybody? So today I want to talk to you about Buzzsprout. The Average Joe Finances podcast recently switched over to Buzzsprout, and I got to say, I am super happy with the progress. Our podcast is now on every single major platform and reaching audiences that we couldn't reach before, which is just super awesome. So thank you to Buzzsprout for being such a great platform. But also I want to say, hey guys, if you sign up for Buzzsprout and you sign up for one of their paid plans using our link, you'll get a $20 Amazon gift card. So go check them out. It's averagejoefinances.com slash buzzsprout. And we'll make sure the link is in the show notes below. What's going on, everybody? So today I want to talk to you about the podcast editing service that we use for the Average Joe Finances podcast. That is editpods.com. And what I really like about them is it's a subscription-based service, so the prices are fantastic. And not only do they do the podcast episodes for us, but they also make us videos, audiograms, social media caption videos. They do our show notes, thumbnails. It's just fantastic products. Go check them out at editpods.com. Let's get back to today's episode. So think about how we typically operate as Americans. So the scenario that you just mentioned, 
where does where's their money when they earn money where's it going first it's going into the checking account right yep. then from the checking account it may go to an investment account it may go to a savings account mm-hmm. some may go towards bills etc right so really what we're doing is we're not just replacing the mortgage with a home equity line of credit we're also replacing the checking account with a home equity line of credit mm. right so again these HELOCs have the same capabilities as a checking account does online bill pay you log on you can see your balance you can move money around all you want so first and foremost, the money goes into the HELOC because again, okay. time and balance are far more important than interest rate. Then from the HELOC, you deploy your funds as you need to. So if you're on a budget, then you 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 keep that budget. So whatever you would typically save and put in a savings account, you're not putting in a savings account anymore. It's a crappy rate of return, right? Yeah. I'd rather have it in my HELOC. So that becomes my savings account. Then if I want to invest out of my HELOC, which is what I do, then you invest out of your HELOC. So you're you're not just replacing the mortgage; you're also replacing the check account. So their their activities don't change. Okay, so like so, let's hypothetical. Someone's uh, making ten thousand a month. They'll take that mm-hmm. entire ten thousand a month and put it into the HELOC, and then any other bills or you know, let's say they were putting, you know, a thousand dollars a month into a brokerage account, they would just pull it out of the HELOC and put it into the brokerage account that way. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Very interesting. So. How come more people aren't doing this and or or why don't they know about this? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I get that a lot. So one, uh, think about you as the consumer, right? So if you practice this, um, you pay a lot, you pay a fraction of the interest that you would on a mortgage. Is that good or bad for the bank? That's bad, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Less profit, less profits to the bank, so it's bad for the bank. Um, so not only is it less interest to the bank that they earn. But also, what else are you abandoning? The checking and savings account. I'm not saying go close them. I'm just saying don't use it because it's it's not benefiting you. It's actually hurting you. So it's not in the bank's best interest to promote this and to educate it, right? On top of that, if you look at the compensation plans for bankers versus loan officers, loan officers are folks that do mortgages, right? And bankers are folks that do home equity lines of credit. You're not going to get a home equity line of credit for the most part from a mortgage company. They don't offer it. They offer mortgages. Banks are the ones that offer home equity lines of credit. And if you look at the compensation plan of a banker, they don't get paid to do HELOCs. And in fact, uh, we've gone through, you know, over the last seven years, we've got relationships with thousands of banks. And we've had some bankers call us up and say, hey, please don't refer anybody over to us anymore. And we're like, why? And we're like, look, we get paid the same if we get two phone calls a week versus 20. So we'd rather get two. And I'm like, oh my goodness, as an entrepreneur, it's like, that's like nails on a chalkboard, right? You're like, how in the world, if your boss or the owner of this only knew your attitude, that's deplorable. But that's the mentality, right? They don't get paid to do a HELOC. And, and sometimes they do. When I say that, it, there might be 250 bucks. But if you look at the compensation on a $400,000 mortgage, that could pay four or five or $6,000 in compensation to the loan officer. Not to mention probably 12000 in profit to the lender, right? So what would you promote? You got to put food on the table. So don't expect the bankers to know this because the banks aren't going to tell the bankers, educate the consumers on a loophole that's going to have them paying a fraction of the interest back to us that they would on a mortgage. Oh, by the way, we're also not going to get their deposit accounts. And you know that's the other half of our business. People think that we only educate consumers, which is the bulk of our business, but we also educate banks. So we show banks a consumer-friendly way to do this but also benefit the balance sheet of the bank. Okay. That way it's a win-win and it helps banks promote it. Now that's a tall order. And you know, we've, we've gone through thousands of relationships and there are some banks that have really taken this on and said, yep, this is what we want to do. And we're building programs around this message and the strategy because you just can't dispute the math. Right on. So what, what about, what about somebody, um, pe- people go through many things, right? You saw what happened in 2008 mm-hmm. with, with uh, the the mortgage crisis and what happened with real estate, um, what what if somebody's in a situation, you know, because a lot of people that listen to my show, that their focus is to get out of debt and start saving mm-hmm. up so they can, you know, buy their initial home or you know invest in real estate, buy some more real estate, right? So what happens uh, to somebody? Because you know, we always recommend having you know three to six months of an emergency fund in mm-hmm. case of loss of income. So what right. if somebody's in a situation where they're they're doing this strategy and they lose their job or 
you know, whatever, mm-hmm. there's some type of emergency and they lose their income for a few months. What would happen to someone in that situation? It's a great question. And in fact, we just went through, um, not 2008, and I didn't have a business in 2008, but we had something that was similar to 2008. We had a crisis, right? So we had COVID-19. So lots of unemployment, right? A lot of folks lost their job, or furloughed, um, even death. So we had about a dozen clients that we had had for three or four years. And those things happen, right? Life happens. So this isn't just a strategy that can be amazing in times of, or of thriving. It can also be a great strategy when you need to survive. So think about it this way. And I'll get into the hedge fund balance sheet statistics and default rates on mortgages versus first lien HELOCs here in a little bit. But once I explain this, you'll know why the default rates on first lien HELOCs is 115 times lower than mortgages during the 2008-2009 crash. So let's say you got a HELOC, you've been practicing the strategy for two or three years, and you go from a $300,000 balance to 150 because our average client pays their home off and or can pay their home off in five years. So half of your balance is paid off in two or three years. So you still have access to that 300,000. You don't have to get reapproved. You don't have to get income qualified to access your equity. It's there 24 seven. So if you had 300,000, you paid half of it off, your balance is 150, but you still have access to 150. No different than a credit card, right? If you have a credit card that has a limit of 10 grand and you paid half of it down, don't you have access to another five grand? Absolutely. So it's the exact same thing on the home equity line of credit. And a lot of these HELOCs, not all, but a lot of these HELOCs, you don't even have to make a payment to. So if you're struggling and you've had a loss of income uh, or a complete loss of income, and you've got a minimum payment on that 150, so they're number one, let's, let's you know, weigh the pros and cons. If I have a loss of income, do I want a payment on a HELOC, which is interest only on the new balance? Or do I want a mortgage, this principal and interest payment on the original balance? Which one would I want? I would want the HELOC. That's going to give me more flexibility, right? However, you don't even have to make that payment because a lot of these HELOCs, they will make the payment for you. So if you don't make the payment, what they do is they say, okay, you owe 150. The interest only portion was 500 bucks. So now you owe 150,500. So you're on time until the next month. Now, if you have a credit line of up to 300,000, how many months can you survive doing that? A lot. Quite a long time. Now, it's not ideal. No one would want that situation because you want to completely pay off your debt and invest in things of that nature. So that's not ideal, but that's that's con- a, a scenario that is complete income elimination. However, well, some folks just had income reduction. So they might have been making four, six thousand dollars a month. Instead of six thousand dollars a month, now they're making four, right? So they're still earning income. Well, if you are, whatever income you're earning should still go into the home equity line of credit. And we could run through some mathematical scenarios where even that still pays down the principal on the home equity line of credit and it allows you to survive. So this is a scenario where, you know, if you've got enough access, and that's why I tell folks, if you owe 400,000 and you got a million dollar home, go get a 90% loan to value home equity line of credit, because that doesn't mean you're going and getting a $900,000 loan. You're getting access to 900,000. Your balance is still 400. You're only going to pay interest on the 400 that you've used. You won't pay interest on the other 500 unless you use it. So in times like this, whether it's surviving or an opportunity, have access to your equity. So that's why folks in 2008, 2009, those that had a first lien position HELOC, it's not like they were completely shielded from the real estate market. You know, they still lost their job. They still had a loss of income. But how, why is the default rate so low on folks that had a first lien HELOC versus those that had a mortgage? Because of that, they could leverage the equity to pay itself. The HELOC can cannibalize itself and start paying itself. And, all, and not only that, it can start paying your bills for you too. Yeah. So um, I see what you're saying because like, that's, you know, a great way to also um, put yourself in a situation like, you know, if you owed $400,000 on a million dollar home, you know, you take out a 90% loan to value HELOC. I mean, you're, you're sitting there with about, you know, another 400,000 that you could potentially invest if you needed to. Right. Uh, or if mm-hmm. something, something came up like an opportunity, uh, another real estate opportunity came up and you needed the, the cash for it. You've got it. Right. Um, yep. So that's definitely uh, interesting. Now, I, I don't know too much about HELOCs. I was actually looking at uh, getting one here soon myself. Um, mm-hmm. 
but you know what I've been looking at like the is the different terms, right? So the one that I was mm-hmm. looking at is um, it, you can use it for the first ten years, uh, but you have to pay mm-hmm. it back in twenty years. Is how that one was particularly set up, and it was actually one hundred percent loan to value, uh, which was really mm-hmm. cool. Um, yeah. So that's uh, um, that's ballsy of that lender or that bank, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially yeah. post COVID. That that was. I wouldn't say typical. It was still a bit on the risky side prior mm-hmm. to COVID. Post COVID, a lot of banks ratcheted back how much they were willing to lend on these HELOCs. So if you've got one out there that's still willing to do a hundred percent, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 a local bank out here in Hawaii, mm-hmm. so it was pretty interesting. Um, but I was actually looking at that to to just pull some equity out of my uh, primary residence, but. Uh, I, I'm really like kind of digging in right now in, into this strategy and I'm trying to work the equation in my head. So <laughs> I, th- I think I'm going to talk to you a little bit more after this, but um, it's, well, it's think about it this way. I mean, very interesting. You have inflation. You talked about borrowing to invest, right? Mm-hmm. It's not, even if you've got one of the worst investments out there, you're still going to quadruple your money versus what you're getting as far as equity in your home, right? I mean, right. with interest rates the way they are right now, and they're not going to stay this way. They are, are eventually going to go up. But I mean, hey, we're at the bottom. So even if they go up, we're coming off of the bottom. They're still going to be really low for years to come. Mm-hmm. And then you tack on the uh, interest deduction for tax deductions on that interest that you're paying. You're almost borrowing free money. Yeah. So if you gave me money and I invested into something that had a horrible rate of return, but it did have a rate of return, I, I, that's actually a great investment. So why not borrow almost free money during an inflationary period to invest in? Well, yeah, especially with with the way inflation is right now, you know, with the announcement they had the other day with it, uh, you know, this year they're saying it's 4%. I mean, right now, um, my my current mortgage is two and a quarter percent after my last refinance. Mm-hmm. And I'm uh, I'm making pretty much 1.75% <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. a year just because I have a, a mortgage this low. So I'm actually making money off the inflation, uh, which is kind of scary when you think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's definitely very interesting. Uh, now, uh, we, we kind of, we briefly spoke about this, right? And uh, it was when I, when I had mentioned about somebody taking that extra um, equity in their line of credit and using it to invest in more real estate. Now, what if somebody wanted to, instead of their debt pay down, like, you know, just keep everything normal and and keep making their payments, but they wanted to take a large chunk of that equity and strictly invest it. I, I know, mm-hmm. um, you know, your strategy is mostly to help people get their homes paid down in five to seven years, right? But what if somebody says, hey, I want to pay my, I want to pay my home down in 15 years, but I want to invest, you know, this much per year. Um, is something like that possible? Not only possible, it's great. You know, and, and I would also say why 15 years? It depends on your life cycle, right? Yeah. You know, let's say you got somebody who's 35 years old. Why pay off in 15 years? Depending on what the cost of debt is, you know, 30 years from now. But the cost is really low and it's been low. The last time it was skyrocketed and really high was 1981. Okay. So that was 40 years ago. Uh, when it comes to HELOC rates and also mortgage rates, that's the last time rates were really, really high. Since 1981, it's been plummeting ever since. We've hit zero twice now. Um, other countries went into negative interest rate territory. So I don't see that changing. Yeah, is it going to fluctuate based on inflation here and there? Absolutely. But rates are going to be low. So there's an argument to why even pay it off. So think about it this way let's say you've got access to equity in your home and you leverage that equity to go buy real estate, right? That's a cash flow asset. Well, you're buying real estate that is a cash flow asset. What does that do? That increases your monthly income. Your monthly income is going where? It's going into your HELOC. So you actually just accelerated the process of paying down the equity because your cash flow is higher. Now you can also get HELOCs on investment properties. It's rare, but you can. There are banks out there that do 80% financing on a purchase. And if you want to buy a home starting out with a HELOC, not a mortgage, you use their HELOC product and say, I'm buying this home. You start out with 20% down. You've got a rental property uh, that's on a interest only, simple interest, interest only home equity line of credit and first lien position that now improves your cash flow for that rental property, which improves your net monthly income, which decreases the balance at a more accelerated fashion. And then what do you do? Every time it's accelerating, you find more opportunities. So yeah, they don't. I mean, this is the Robert Kiyosaki method. So when I say, you know, pay your home off in five to seven years, I'm going to be honest with a lot of folks. That's a hook 
because some most folks, they just want to be debt free because they don't know any better. However, once they get into our strategy and our education, they realize, hmm, maybe it's not right the right time for me to be debt free. Maybe it's time for me to accumulate cash flow assets and then be debt free later. So it's not an either or situation. It can be a both. OK, yeah, no, I like that. Um and yeah, there there is like that the 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 two different types of mentalities, right? You have the mm-hmm. the Dave Ramsey mentality where it's mm-hmm. you know all debt's bad debt, get rid of it, and uh, you know I, I want to be at zero. And then you have the the Kiyosaki method where it's like, hey, I'm going to leverage my debt to buy more income producing assets. That that that's kind of where my head's at, you know. And and probably yeah. most people listening to my show, uh, you know, it, it's funny because I talk about it, and um, neither one of them are wrong. And right, I right, no. up, but and, you know, and I'm in things... Franklin. I'm in Dave Ramsey's backyard. Actually, yeah. he's, he's a member of my church. So yeah, I, I know Dave Ramsey. I, I actually taught Financial Peace University in my church. I understand his, his philosophy, cool. but you have to understand that they have two different audiences. Dave Ramsey is, is talking to, I hate to say it, but it's true, a lower educated, a less disciplined audience, right? Mm-hmm. And can you gain wealth doing Dave Ramsey's method? Absolutely. Slow and painful. It hurts. Rice and beans, right? Get after it like a gazelle. It's slow and painful, but you can. It's going to take longer. Mathematically, yeah. Robert Kiyosaki is the faster method, but his audience isn't to a free radio show. His audience is to typically the top three tax brackets, right? They already get it. They already mastered their budget. They're high income earners. They're higher educated. And mathematically, it's just a faster method. So neither one of them are wrong. It's just pick which route you want to go. Yeah, I mean, so like it's, it's one of the things. It's one of the things I talked about, you know, early on in my podcast too. When I when I did a couple solo episodes, I was talking about, you know, I followed Dave Ramsey's baby steps. You know, steps one, two, and three. And then after I got to that point where I was debt free and the only debt I had left was my mortgage, that's when I started looking at, okay, what what can I do to invest my money elsewhere and start, you know, leveraging the debt that I have, and and buying more income producing assets. So that's kind of where my mentality shifted. So it's, you know, I, I say this because a lot of people that listen to this show are are people that are looking to get out of debt, right? They or or there's people that have already gotten to that point and they're like, hey, what do I do with my money? So mm-hmm. um, that's why I think this is a very interesting strategy that you can go into with either mindset, right? Depending mm-hmm. on what it is you want to do. You want to pay off your house in five to seven years, awesome. You can do that. You want to pay it off in 30 years still, but leverage that money to buy more real estate? Sure, you can do that. And that's what I think is so interesting about this and, and why I'm so excited to talk to you about it. It's pretty cool, man. Mm-hmm. And I want to answer that one question you started to ask sure. was the, the HELOC that you're looking at is a 10-year draw period followed by a 20-year repayment period. Mm-hmm. So what that means is, is you have full access to the equity in your home uh, based on the original contract, right? So if you current homes valued at three, well, you're in Hawaii, uh, three million. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's currently valued at 3 million and you got a line of credit today based on 3 million, well, then that's going to be your line of credit for 10 years, unless you change that contract, right? Now, after 10 years, if you have a balance still remaining, then what the bank is going to do is allocate that balance to now on a 20 year mortgage. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a closed end, still a simple interest, but it's a closed end product that requires you to pay it off in an installment loan fashion for the next 20 years. So how do we keep something like that for 30 years? If there's only a 10 year draw period, it's real simple. Do what the mortgage people do, refinance. And then 10 years from now, what do you think the value of your property is going to be? Higher, typically, Typically right? And and, and Hawaii typically doubles every 10 years. So (laughs) yeah. So now what do you do in in 10 years? You're going to get another HELOC at the higher valuation and access to more equity to go get more rental property. Mm -hmm. Maybe you get into commercial at that point. I like it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Get into commercial at that point. I'm I'm looking at getting into commercial right now. <laughs> so yeah, yeah not even there. more doors. Yeah. Awesome, man. Um, okay, cool. Hey, this, this has been, um, awesome. I, I've, I've got a lot of great notes here. Um, and I think you answered all the questions I wanted to ask you. Um, yeah, I think I hit about everything. Well, let's do this. I know this is something that you're looking at. Yeah. So let's work one-on-one after this. And I want to, I want to work with you one-on-one and I want to, you know, answer any questions or concerns that you have and help you with the bank and mechanize it and all that to get you off uh, on, on the right path. Sure. Yeah. And, Definitely interested in chatting yeah. about that. Yeah. So, Hey, um, real, real quick. Uh, 
this is one of the things I like to ask uh, towards the end anyway. And, and that's, uh, you know, for, for my listeners that are listening in right now, and this is something that interests them, is there anything like any last tips or tricks that you would recommend for them to, to look into if this is a strategy they'd like to implement? It, it's real simple. Go to replaceyourmortgage.com. There's nowhere on our website that we ask you for money. Nowhere. We're, we're always giving free information. So if you go to replaceyourmortgage.com, there's a couple of things. There are lots of videos on there. You go to YouTube. We have even more videos on YouTube at Replace Your Mortgage uh, YouTube channel. But if you go to replaceyourmortgage.com, the only call to action after you pre-educated yourself, I've got a free book on the subject. So you can just download it tonight and read it. No charge, no shipping, nothing. Just download it. Uh, but after you, you've kind of convinced yourself like, okay, this is something I need to look further into. I have a, a, a sales staff that almost works around the clock. You book an appointment. That's the only call to action on our website is to book an appointment with us. And it's a free appointment. And what we do for 45 minutes is look at your situation and see if this is a good fit for you because it's not. And I'm going to break a lot of hearts here. This isn't the right fit for 70% of Americans. Why? Because most Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And if you are living paycheck to paycheck and haven't mastered your budget, this is not going to work for you. And in fact, it could be detrimental to you. There is no sidestep to budgeting. You have to master your own personal finances. Now, if you have, and you got a 660 plus credit score, 10% equity in your home, and you're cash flow positive, meaning you've mastered your budget, well, then yeah, we'll tell you what your options are and what it looks like and when's your debt-free date or what does your net worth look like if you were to adopt our uh, various strategies to gaining wealth. All of that is free. Yeah, that's you, you can't beat that. You know, free free is my favorite price, and I'm sure a lot of people listening, <laughs> it's their favorite price too. So yeah. So you already mentioned uh, your website, but and um, I know you have a YouTube channel too. Do you have any other social media mm -hmm. or anything else like that that people could check out? I'm terrible at Instagram. Uh, if you go to my Instagram, <laughs> which is Michael Lush 13, um, you're going to find stuff like this where I'm deer hunting, I'm hanging out with family. So yeah, on Facebook, oh. I'm I wouldn't say all business, but I'm mostly business on Facebook. Instagram, uh, I haven't tackled that one yet, um, or at least my team hasn't. And I'm the one posting on there, and it shows because yeah, it's about good. family, it's about events, it's about America, and it's about deer hunting. Yeah, good stuff, man. Um, all right, so I'm going to make sure we have all those links in our show notes, uh, including mm -hmm. your YouTube channel, your website, all that goodness, uh, just to make it easier for the folks that are listening to copy and paste or just click away and go check out and see what Michael Lush is all about and what his team's doing. And uh, maybe this might be a strategy that might work for them. So pretty excited, man. And uh, I'm excited to talk to you after this. Um, but yeah. seriously, man, it was, it was a pleasure having you on the show today. I really appreciate you taking some time. To thanks talk for to having me. It's nine o'clock where I'm at and there's nothing better to do other than sleep. So thanks, Mike. <laughs> Woo. It's almost 5 PM here. So it's all well, good. Actually. Yeah. It's almost 10. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> Uh, that's all all right, right. I'm, I'm a night owl. Yeah. I appreciate it, Mike. Thanks. All right. Take care.